And I've got a big old smile on my face because I just looked up and I saw the picture of John Zadrozny, who is joining us today. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, Mandy. Uh, I'm doing great. It's great to be on your show. Good. I'm glad you're here. Well, let me give folks just a recap of your background. Now, um, John served in a number of roles for President Trump. He was the deputy assistant to the president for policy. He worked at the Department of State. He served as the acting chief of staff at U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services at the Department of Homeland Security. He also worked for Senator Cruz and worked for the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee Chairman, Daryl Issa. Back in the day, he currently is the director of the Center for Homeland Security and Immigration at America First Policy Institute, a really great institution. It's safe to say that John is an absolute expert on these issues. He was in the room with the president when a lot of the major decisions were made with regard to President Trump's immigration policies. We're very excited to have you here today to talk us through what's going on. Now, uh, look, the, the beginning point is there was a stable situation at the border. When you and I walked out of the administration on January 20th, the border situation was very stable. Security measures were working. The wall was being built. And that situation has quickly spiraled into one of the largest humanitarian crises now, can you just give us a latest assessment uh, from your perspective, uh, beyond what I just said, of what's really going on at the border right now? Sure, Mandy. So basically, we are at a point where we're one plus years into this administration, and in the last year or so, uh, anywhere from two to two point five million, and possibly even more, individuals have come across the border because of the Biden administration's open borders policies. Um, I, and don't forget, too, that includes the people they've allowed to come in pending asylum claims, um, but basically they are illegal aliens who, are, if we were following the law, would never be eligible for asylum, uh, and they would have been kept out under the previous policies, under the Remain in Mexico policy and a few other policies that President Trump had installed. Um, but in addition to that, there are lots of people who we don't know across the border. That's why there's that wild card at the end. I mean, it's kind of scary when the wild card is in addition to 2.5 million, but we literally don't know about a lot of people who've crossed because for all the people who have crossed and turned themselves into the Border Patrol every morning on people's private property in Texas and Arizona, uh, there are an awful lot of people who sneak across the border in camouflage carrying you know, rifles and rucksacks in the middle of the night. We don't know who they are. Or we don't know where they are. And hopefully we'll find out before something really bad happens. One thing I always like to point out, Mandy, is that this is not an accident. This is an engineered policy. This is an open borders policy that this administration wants. So they might occasionally send Vice President Harris down to Guatemala to say, please don't come. But their actions are speaking louder than words. Everything from not finishing the wall construction that was required under the previous administration to um, basically demoralizing the Border Patrol and, and you know turning them into an enemy and destroying morale in the Border Patrol, all of these things have an impact. And everything they've done as opposed to what they tell an audience in front of a press conference or in a foreign government is uh, please come. And we're seeing the results. It's so frustrating. It truly is an instance where their actions are speaking much, much louder than their words. Now, you mentioned the remain in Mexico policy. Could you just describe that a little bit for the listeners and why that proved so effective and what this administration has since done to essentially undercut that policy? Absolutely, Mandy. So the Remain in Mexico policy was designed basically to make it so that if you were coming to, a, uh, to the United States, the U.S.-Mexico border from a country other than, other than Mexico, uh, we had arranged, uh, we'd basically set it up so that we would not uh, allow you to enter the country until it was time for your asylum hearing. So in other words, you're coming from, let's say, El Salvador, and you want to request asylum in the United States. Basically, you'd meet at the border with an immigration official, uh, they'd hand you a piece of paper and say, okay, uh, your hearing, your asylum hearing is going to be in six weeks. In the meantime, you have to stay in Mexico or, you know, preferably stay in Mexico because in theory the country from which you've, you're coming is too dangerous to return. Uh, but you have to stay in Mexico until your hearing. We won't let you in until then. Well, that was a, a, a major break from the way it used to work. The way it used to work was every previous administration, Republican and Democrat, unfortunately, would say, okay, well, uh, come on in, uh, do whatever you want. Here's a working permit. Uh, your court date's in a few weeks. Some would show up. Some wouldn't. Many wouldn't. Um, and then sometimes years later, you'd catch some of those people who allegedly wanted asylum, 
and uh, the judge, an immigration judge, might find that they no longer have an asylum claim, but looks like they've got three kids here and they've got roots and they're not going anywhere. Um, the Remain in Mexico policy was crucial because it did two things. One of which is it forced, it ended the catch and release policy that had been part of the the process that had just been assumed to be part of the process before. And it dramatically reduced asylum fraud because the reality was a lot of those people who have been coming and are still coming from Central America and the Middle East and everywhere else on the globe, they were banking on being able to get into the country and disappearing. Remain in Mexico pro- prohibited that. It basically said, you've got a four to six week wait in Mexico. Good luck. We'll see you in a few weeks. Yeah. And as a result, a lot of the people who weren't going to be able to scan the system said, well, screw this. I'm going home. Yeah. That did a lot of things. But among the most important thing was it really reduced fraud because anyone who was really fleeing uh, persecution for religion or political beliefs or whatever, uh, they'd wait it out because they can't go back to their home country because they literally are being persecuted. But a lot of people who were just trying to get a job or were just trying to sneak in because they liked the benefits here turned around and went home. By the way, they're not eligible for asylum in the future because if it was so gosh darn bad that you had to leave the country and claim asylum, how on earth could you return to that country in the future? Um, so it was a real fraud reducer. For obvious reasons, the Biden administration had to end it because fraud is not really a concern for them. Volume for the future amnesty that they want is the biggest priority. It's it's so frustrating. And it's it's almost as if they just – anything that the Trump administration did, they were like, well, we're going to get rid of it, whether it works or not. And as you're conveying to us, um, it's their goal to create this open border situation all along. I like how you said that was basically an engineered approach from there. And now you mentioned – it's not just that they're they're doing away with policies that make it easier to get in, but there's all these incentives that they have extended to illegal immigrants. I'm not sure if you caught a clip. I saw it earlier this morning. It was posted on RNC Research. They're pretty good at staying on top of these things. But AOC was bragging about how she helped many illegal immigrants get access to stimulus checks. So she's devoting her federal taxpayer um, dollars that she gets to fund her her congressional seat operation to help illegal immigrants access, get access to stimulus checks. Now, that's not the only incentive that um, illegal immigrants have had access to. Could you walk us through some of those and why, you know, that that's along the lines of actions, while they may say don't come, the actions are, hey, when you get here, we're going to take care of you in, in a way that in some instances is better than how U.S. citizens are treated. Uh, Mandy, that's a, I didn't know about that, but that doesn't surprise me. And I actually wonder if, if uh, AOC's actions may actually technically be illegal, uh, yeah. whether or not she's an elected official or not, because she's basically encouraging lawless behavior, and that should have consequences. Agreed. But it doesn't – put that aside, it's a metaphor for the bigger problem, which is, yes, there are an awful lot of goodies and an awful lot of benefits for people who come here illegally. And, I, you know, we had four years – and it, it was difficult achieving the things we did achieve, trying to make sure that benefits only went to people who were lawfully here or appropriately here. But you'd be amazed. For example, uh, one thing that we discovered in horror was that if you're ordered removed from the country, um, you know, when you come into the country legally, let's say you come in on an asylum claim, uh, if they released you into the United States, they'd give you what's called an EAD, an employment authorization document. Mm-hmm. That's basically what allows you to work legally in the country. Um, but we found that even when people were being denied asylum claims, they still kept their EADs and still got to work. What? Um, we also found that, um, for example, if you were ordered removed, let's say you're an illegal alien, you, you weren't prohibited from getting an EAD as an illegal alien, believe it or not. But let's say you got one and then you were finally ordered removed by an immigration judge. Even with a final order of removal, that didn't mandate the, the stripping of your EAD so you could still work. So you want to know why no one ever leaves. It's because the incentives to stay – are so great, and the ability, the, the the will to actually enforce the law and remove people who are illegally here is is clear was clearly not present until the Trump administration in any meaningful way. That why not risk it? Like why not travel thousands of miles? Why not send your child with a coyote? Um, it'll be worth it in the end, monetarily and benefit-wise, for you to take that chance to get in the country because Americans just give away so much money, or they can take advantage of a system that's not trying to stop them at all. Yeah, that's just that's so mind boggling to me, mind boggling to me. Um, we, John, we've got a couple of questions coming in on our ceasefire text line. Um, I'm not sure if uh, if you may have the answers to this, but I'm going to read them out and then we're going to have to take a short break. 
we'll have round two with you, but um, we have one question from Joe and Meridian. How many illegals does that average per state, even down by county? And if you don't necessarily know that, if you know somewhere, we could point folks to to find that type of information. But we're going to take a quick break. I want our listeners to sit tight. We've got round two with John Zdrozny to talk more about the state of immigration under the Biden administration and a few other national security issues. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Mississippi. And if you're just joining us, one, we are so happy you're with us. And two, I am on the phone with John Zadrozny, who served as a deputy assistant to the president for policy, an expert in all things immigration. And we were talking about the current situation at the border, which just keeps to keeps getting worse. And John, I left it with a question from someone from our text line, basically asking about if you knew how many illegals um, it, the 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 two point um, you know and some change million coming over the border. How that averages that we know of that that averages per state. And if you didn't have that information, if there were any good websites um, that you could direct folks to to find this type of critical information that the mainstream media is largely trying to ignore. That, I mean, that that's a really good caller from your question, Mandy. I, the, I don't have those specific numbers. I mean, I think yeah. you could probably instinctively figure out that a lot of the illegals uh, that are crossing the border and being allowed in by this administration, uh, they're if they're moving on their own, they're going to go to places where the, the benefits are the best, which will tend to be Democrat-run states. Uh, you probably, however, have also seen the headlines recently uh, of how the Biden administration is literally flying people at taxpayer expense, mind you, uh, from the border to states and, and cities in states without local or state awareness. Yeah. Um, it's happened in Pennsylvania. It's happened in Texas. It's happening probably in Mississippi, too. Um, but to taking a step back on, the, on the, the bigger question of illegal immigration, I think it's, it's important for your audience to understand that the, the number of people who are legally present in the United States is way higher than they've been told. Um, you know, any number that Chuck Schumer has been using for 20 years is obviously a lie. Yeah. Uh, he has <laughs> used the 11-point-something million number since – early 2000s. I honestly think that's a focus group tested number that, you know, makes people feel like it's big enough to do something, but not small enough, to, but small enough to not be threatening. Yeah. Realistically, based on what we know and the things we've seen, that number is more likely between 20 and 30 million. That's not including Joe Biden's latest uh, invitation and the 2.5 or so million who've come in over the last year. Um, and so there are quite a few people in the country who are here illegally. I mean, I think it's that's what's staggering about the numbers. If it is, let's just say for the sake of argument, that it's 30 million, um, that's basically one in 10 Americans. Think about the cascading effects of that, not just the, the lawlessness that results from having someone who shouldn't be here illegally in the country, but think about all the downstream monetary and non-monetary costs from law enforcement um, to benefits to um, injuries to school burdens to the things it pushes on the taxpayer. Uh, it's a lot. And it's not a minor deal, and it's not a small number. So um, I wish I had a number. I wish I could point you to a resource that has these numbers. But the problem is it's actually one of the best-kept secrets, and I think that's something we should focus on in the future. The federal government should figure out, use its resources to determine from all the things it's got at its fingertips to figure out how many people are actually illegally in the country. It's going to be way bigger than people think. Yeah, I think that's that's an important takeaway for sure. Now, back to this issue of the flights. Who's sponsoring this flight? Is this the federal government that is taking illegals and flying them across the country in the dead of night? The answer is yes, directly and indirectly. So the federal government is basically orchestrating this all. And they've done it, though, through uh, nonprofit organizations, many of which have a religious affiliation, or at least appear to. So, for example, Catholic Charities and uh, uh, one of the – there are several, but I know that, for example, Catholic Charities is perhaps one of the largest. Um, these organizations, and some smaller ones whose names you haven't heard, you know, they, they present themselves as charitable 501c3 organizations. The reality is they receive all their money from the federal government. Um, these aliens are detained at the or you know encountered at the border. Uh, they're basically given a welcome packet. <laughs> it's yeah. like being a freshman at college now. Like if you're an illegal alien, you get a Manila envelope full of goodies and places to go where you can get discounts and where you can get a free bank account. And, 
um, then they're funneled in the direction of these nonprofit organizations, which then literally pay for their tickets, bus tickets, plane tickets, um, other things that will help them along the way. And they are basically fully federal funded, fu- fully federally funded. Um, in fact, we encountered one. I was in Del Rio this past summer with some colleagues, and we, we encountered a nonprofit organization in Del Rio who – she didn't, the, the CEO, she didn't know who we were. So she just starts excitedly talking about how, yeah, we're buying them plane tickets and bus tickets and we're sending them oh, wow. to Mississippi and Texas and Missouri. And Jeez. after about 10 minutes, she realized this was kind of an interesting message that we weren't sure we wanted to hear. And she's like, where are you guys from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, it was really clear they are fully federally funded. They are the private sector instrumentality of this bad policy. And, you know, states and local State and local authorities have a lot of say here. I think this is – it's worth saying, you know, in Mississippi and elsewhere, these organizations answer to licensing requirements for the state. Um, so if your states have concerns about this, uh, if people who are – if you see something going on with a nonprofit organization that may not be cooperating and maybe facilitating illegal immigration, this is something your state government can tackle or your local government can tackle. No, that's good to know. It's it's important for folks to know that, that we do have tools available to us through our local legislators to push back, um, even when the federal government is trying to cram um, unauthorized actions out on the rest of us just to fulfill a political goal. So let's talk a little bit about that political goal. It seems like every time there's some major legislative action coming down the pike in Washington, D.C., Democrats want to die on this hill of pushing amnesty provisions, we saw that with the um, we we saw that with the recent bipartisan infrastructure bill. Certainly made up huge portions of the Build Back Better or Build Back Broke, uh, more aptly put, initiatives that Biden continues to push. But why why is this such a centerpiece of the Democrats' long term political policies? Mandy, I think it's because they have no choice. I, I, you know, the, the left is very loud in this country. The Democrat Party is in your face, and they seem they make it seem because they get friendly media coverage as well, like they are the supermajority party and they are the future in this country. I actually think they're they're dying demographically. Uh, I think they've got some real issues, uh, and I think that legal immigration is part of the solution for them. The ability to provide amnesty to tens of millions of people at the stroke of a pen is essential. I mean, you know, Mandy, it turns out when you spend 50 years of boarding Americans in the womb, you're short about 60 million voters. And so when you have that problem, you know, when you when you basically are short a large tens of millions of people who might have been voting for you, um, when you have Marxist policies that turn most Americans off, um, and you are, are basically just engineering the failure of the country and upsetting even the people who used to be your base, well, what are your options, really? You know, you've got two choices. You can revamp your worldview and change your policies to fit the electorate. Or you can find new voters. And the left in this country, via the Democrat Party, has chosen the latter. It's really clear to me this is based, it's like what my colleague Ken Blackwell here at AFPI calls the, the voters without borders movement. This is really about finding their new base because they no longer are even trying to appeal to you or me. Um, they've just gone in search of a new majority. And unfortunately, we've a lot of states have played along. These sanctuary jurisdictions have, are a big part of the problem. You know, that you wonder why. Um, states are all in on illegal immigration, and the, especially the, the deep blue states. Uh, well, look what it gets them, Mandy. It gets them a lot of money. We had this fight regarding the census back in 2020, yeah. um, not counting citizens, because you shouldn't be able to count non-citizens, because if you're counting non-citizens, you're basically incentivized as a government in the United States to have an illegal alien population, and that gets you money and extra congressional representation. Um, it's a huge problem, but I really actually, in a strange way, I view it as a silver lining yeah. because I think our policies, the conservative universe policies, are winning. Um, the left can't compete intellectually, so it has to go out and, and just, like, provide amnesty to tens of millions of illegal aliens. Uh, and if we can hold the line, I think our, our, our views will eventually win the day. I totally agree with that. Um, you know, but you mentioned the Border Patrol, it, it, and a lot of these policies um, – it's like the administration is constantly trying to find a scapegoat for problems they've created. And in some instances, they've pointed the blame and the finger at our Border Patrol agents, which is beyond offensive for anyone who 
willingly signs up to put their life on their line to keep this country safe and U.S. citizens. But have you interacted with Border Patrol agents? And, you know, what is what is the readout on the morale of that agency in an administration under an administration where the tools that they traditionally have had to do their job are just being pulled away from them time and again? No, that's a great question, man. This is this is one of the the most shameless episodes, uh, you know, in, in an administration that it has an awful lot of poor performance. This may be one of their lowest moments, where they've decided to basically do everything they can to demoralize one of the hardest working groups of people, and the, the you know people who literally wake up every day um, and have volunteered their careers to patrol a desert and risk being shot or attacked or wounded by cartels. Um, that episode that happened at the border where they where the Biden administration President Biden and his political team were jumping to conclusions out of the door without any information accusing border patrol agents of whipping Haitians turns out that wasn't the case um, and there's a, they're sitting on a report by the way which likely vindicates those officers but they don't want that to get out because that would make them the politicians look bad um, that's just one episode of a daily demoralization effort on the part of the Biden administration. But unfortunately, Mandy, I think this is part and parcel of their larger strategy to destroy immigration enforcement in this country, because it's one thing for them to politically shut off enforcement, demoralize the Border Patrol. Eventually, the Border Patrol will start to shrink. Um, Attrition is going to be a real problem in the coming years and months, even after this administration, uh, because you're you're going to be really hard-pressed to draw anyone to become a Border Patrol agent uh, for a variety of reasons. And the the coming wave of attrition is just something they're going to use. They'll bootstrap themselves into even less enforcement. They'll say, gosh, we we don't have as many Border Patrol agents as we, we like. Well, gosh, that's because you, you demoralized the place and everyone left. Well, John, John, um, I'd love to keep talking with you, but we'll have to leave it there. We're running out of time. Thank you for joining us, and I can't wait for someone like you to be back in the driver's seat on these issues.